We've come a long way, all the way to the end of Revelation. Just two times, just a couple charts uh, to take us up to the speed tonight. Let me give you the first one as we review a lot. I'm not going to review that much tonight, but I am going to review generally. So let me give you this one first. So this is from creation. If you want to know the whole Bible, there it is. This is from creation. This is the fall of mankind uh, right over here, and I'm not working on that. Creation. You have uh, Israel formed in Genesis chapter 12. God makes promises to Abraham. I will bless you. I will give, your, I'll give you a seed. And all the nations of the earth will be blessed by you. That's kind of interesting. Your seed will be as the stars of the sky and the sands of the sea. Three major monotheistic religions today uh, will trace themselves back to Abraham. Christianity, Judaism, and of course Islam. So they go back to Islam. So, so Abraham not having a seed, by the way, not until he's 99. How many of you understand that? 99 and 90. How many know what a miracle is? That is a miracle. Here you go. Then we have the fall of Israel, the diaspora. Uh, they, are, they are dispersed. Uh, we have Jesus' birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, and the gospels uh, given out. Then we have Jesus' ascension. And then we have the Spirit given at Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. And then we have the church age, which we're living in now. We talked about that in Revelation chapters, chapter uh, 1 to 3. And then we have Israel reborn. That's 1948 in your lifetime. Sets the prophetic clock back in motion. And then we have the next event on the church calendar is the rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. And the trump of God will sound. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up so forever to be with the Lord near. That's the rapture of the church, followed immediately by the seven-year tribulation, mentioned not only in Revelation, but also in Jeremiah and Daniel. Then we have the return of Christ, the physical return. The rapture of the church, Christ comes in the air. The physical return is uh, in Matthew, he talks about him coming back to establish his kingdom. Uh, we know that when he comes back, he'll step foot on the Mount of Olives, according to Zechariah. Uh, the Mount of Olives will split from, from north to south. A plane will rise up and he'll go into the battle of Armageddon at that, and end the tribulation. He will set up a thousand-year millennium. Uh, where Christ will rule from Jerusalem. Uh, and this is where people get really messed up because some people, most, I don't want to go against any churches because I think churches, you know, they're, the gates of hell won't prevail against them and they're, they're God's anointed, anointed uh, vehicle. But a lot of times, preaching will stop right here, sometimes right here. Very little teaching on tribulation, very little teaching on the end times, and almost no teaching on this. And so, but there's a lot left. Left. So we'll see the millennial kingdom, a thousand year reign. We know that Satan will be bound for a thousand years. He'll be loosed for a thousand. He'll be loosed after that time to try to make one last effort about the to the people that are here to surround Jerusalem. Uh, but a fire will come down from heaven. First Peter says, and uh, and they'll destroy it. And then we see this uh, this great white throne judgment where all of hell. It's called the second death. Where all of hell will cough up. It's, it's uh, spirits and the dead bodies that are unsaved will be resurrected and they will go into the lake of fire. Then we have the new heaven and new earth, eternity, and we have the new Jerusalem coming down. So if you want to see the full recap of that, that's that, that's that chart. Now it's kind of a lot, so let me give you this one. So as we go over here, this is where Christ died. Okay, this is the ascension. This is the age of grace. You're living in this right now, the age of grace. We know that Israel was dispersed 1,900 years plus. Uh, Jesus gave a prophecy in Matthew chapter 24. He said, not one stone will be left upon another. He talked about the temple being destroyed. They were in 70 AD. Titus of Rome came down, who later became a Roman emperor. He destroyed the temple. The, the Jews were, were, were scattered. Uh, they went to the four corners of the, of the world. Uh, the Jews that went into, uh, into Europe are Ashkenazi Jews. Jews that went into Africa are Shafar. Jews. We know that there's prophecy after prophecy in the Old Testament that says that the Jews, towards the end times, the Jews will be drawn back. Well, that's called Eliah. Eliah means coming from different nations. Jews assimilated to other nations. You have German Jews, Polish Jews. We know what Hitler did. He tried to, he tried to rid Europe of all of its Jews, putting them in concentration camps, over 18 of them. And so we see that the Jews, Hitler unwittingly played into God's hands. That sounds strange, doesn't it? But evil always plays into God's hands. Because Hitler did that, the Jews did not just dis disseminate and blend out. What happened was they wanted a homeland. So we had the Zionist movement in the 1900s start, and it was fueled by World War II, so the Jews wanted a homeland. They would make that homeland. By the way, at, at that time, Palestine was, which was, uh, uh, that's not a Arab name. Palestine was a Roman name given to, it, given to Israel after they destroyed Israel. Jerusalem, they renamed Ayatollah Capitolina. They renamed uh, Israel Palestine. It's not from Arabs at all. It's from the Romans. And so, uh, the Jews wanted a homeland. The UN got together and decided they wanted to send them to Argentina. Can you imagine the Holy Land being Argentina? 
be ridiculous. So anyway, they, they, they go to Israel and they settle Israel. They have what's called kibbutzim, which is a plural of kibbutz. The, Israel's a swamp land. They drain the swamp. They drain, they water the desert and they fulfill prophecy. The Bible says in the last days that the desert will bloom, bloom as a rose. Israel today, small nation about the size of Connecticut, exports more fruits and vegetables than any other nation on the planet. Israel has almost about 67, 67 types of fruit that come out of it. Uh, in America, you've got to go to Washington State to get apples, and you've got to go to Florida to get oranges. In Israel, apples and oranges grow across the street from each other. So obviously, God's done something for Israel. In your lifetime, Israel's become a nation. Sets the prophetic clock back, back going. That's why we believe we're in the last days. Because Jesus said, this generation that sees this will not pass away, though these things be fulfilled. Matthew 24, 32. So we have the next event, the rapture. Uh, we will go to the Bema Seat of Christ. We're judged by our works. None of us go to hell. Somebody say amen. We, are not, we don't get punished. We just get a degree of rewards. And then we have the seven-year tribulation here, at which time we'll be doing the marriage supper of the Lamb. There's the, there's the millennial kingdom. Jesus is ruling when he comes back. There's the Mount of Olives that he splits. We know that the nations are judged. Satan is, is put into a bottomless pit. He's brought back up right here at the Great Right Throne Judgment and then the new heavens and the new earth. So if I could give it to you in a simplistic form, because obviously that's pretty tough. Here you go. Tribulation. Final judgment. Of, in, of iniquity and the unrighteous. It's called, also called the day of the Lord in Scripture. Uh, the present heavens, th then we have the millennium, which is the thousand year millennium. Then we have the present heavens and the earth dissolved, Satan cast into the lake of fire. Then we have the new heavens and the new earth created. Then the descent of the new Jerusalem, Revelation chapter 21 and 22. Last week we did 21. This week we'll do 22. That is the new Jerusalem. That is the descent of it. Now again, most people, and then the new heavens and the new earth, eternity starts up again. I think that people don't understand the history of mankind. The history of mankind is leading someplace. We're going somewhere. This world is not going to be like this millennia from now. Several millennia from now, this world is going to be totally changed because there'll be a base of operations where the saved will be ruling the nations. They'll be ruling the rest of whatever God's creation is going to house. And so we never get that concept. We never hear it preached because I think, because there's so much ifs, I guess, and mo most people haven't delved into it. But there is, how many believe something's coming? How many of you think that you're going to go to heaven and sit on a cloud and strum a harp? Please don't raise your hand. Because <laughs> you're not. Heaven is a very active place. God didn't create us just to die and go someplace and do nothing. He created us to be rulers and reigners with him. That is, that's pretty exciting when you think about it. You know, a lot of times we look in the mirror and we, we realize that um, when, I look in, when I get up in the morning, I think I'm 19. Because your brain doesn't age. How many of you know that? Then I look in the mirror and somebody else shows up. I don't know who it is, but somebody else shows up. But you know, the whole idea is we're not, we're not going someplace to die and then just be not used. We're going someplace. We're progressing someplace. Uh, and, and we're giving an opportunity to rule and reign. That's why we're here. That's why the enemy goes at you every single day because he knows that you're going to take his place and you're going to rule and reign someday. So the big picture most people just miss. Revelation gives us that big picture. Lance isn't here. He's, uh, he has some problems, I guess, with his mom. So uh, usually we put Lance on the spot and let him do the Revelation rhyme. Let me tell you about the rhyme. I developed it 30 years ago. I developed it so we can remember a mnemonic, an A to memory, so we can remember what's in Revelation. Let me, let me test you. What's in Revelation chapter 4? Anybody? I w if I went to a group of pastors and they were in a congregation, there was 100 or 200 or 300 of them, and I asked them that, they'd have to open their Bibles. So this is the, the power of that rhyme. So let me give it to you. I know we've gone over and over, but let me give it to you. Revelation chapter 1, you can say it with me. We shall see the sun. Revelation chapter 2, work of churches to do. Chapter 3, where will our church be? Chapter 4, the elders sit, 20 and 4. Chapter 5, a wounded lamb alive. Chapter 6, four horsemen, fire and brimstone mix. Chapter 7, two multitudes taken to heaven. Chapter 8, third of life affected by Wormwood's fate. Chapter 9, Euphrates angels unwind. Chapter 10, land and sea become gods again. Chapter 11, two multitudes taken take to heaven. Chapter 12, it's history and into the wilderness they dwell. Chapter 13, Antichrist will soon turn mean. 14, 144,000 and the vintage judgment scene. 15, seven vials poured out by the angelic team. 16, earth bombarded as never before seen. 1, 7 and 1, 8, mystery Babylon's fall is great. 1-9, a marriage ride to Armageddon's front line. 2-0, the millennium, the judgment. 2-1, new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem begun. And here's 22. 
the Alpha and the Omega remains faithful and true. So that's where we're at in Revelation chapter 22. Let me give you what we've been doing. We've been talking about a vista. Revelation 21, 1 to 22, 5 is a New Testament vista about the New Jerusalem. We're getting a view of the New Jerusalem. Your final home, by the way. How many of you have, how many have a home in Birmingham? How many of you have had more than one home in Birmingham? How many of you have had 15 homes in Birmingham? <laughs> We've had a lot of homes in Birmingham, but that's not our final home. Your final home and my final home is the New Jerusalem for eternity. And so, you know, if you can wrap your head around that just a little bit, maybe you'd want to know about it. You know, Cheryl's a realtor, and uh, so if anybody needs a home, I'm just giving her a free plug. That's not where I'm saying it. She's a realtor, and let me tell you something. When people, that was cheap. We're, she's a realtor, and when people want a home, they have to ask her all kinds of questions about that home. You know, yet we have an eternal home, and I don't know if anybody's asking any questions about it. I mean, where are we going? What's going on with this home? So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Revelation chapter 22. Uh, they discover the mansion of Jesus. By the way, Jesus talked about his father's house are many mansions. He was talking about the, the New Jerusalem. He, he is talking about mansions, by the way, is Italian. It was like an Italian villa. The father has a house. A, ma a son gets married. He gives him a little piece of that land right next to it. And another one. It's a courtyard. So he's talking about this interconnection that we'll have in heaven. So Revelation chapter 22 uh, is this. The Alpha and Omega remains faithful and true. I will show you this at the end and I will tell you what this means all about the last message of God's holy word. And so let me start out with Revelation 22, verse 1. He showed me a river of water of life, bright as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb in the midst of its street. Now he's talking about inside the new Jerusalem. This is not heaven. This is the new Jerusalem. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells not righteousness, but the new Jerusalem is a center of operations. It is our home. Uh, remember, this is still talking about the new Jerusalem, our future home. And I've shown you some pictures. I don't think pictures can do it any justice. It's the center of, eter of our eternal future, of the city of God. It's our city, our eternal base of operations for the future. Now, I can, I can let my mind roam and tell you what, what I think is going to happen, but I'm going to tell you this. We are, if creation happened right here, and this is eternity future, we are right here. We are very close to what happened in creation. This, this is going to be a long, long time. We think a lot of time has passed since Adam and Eve. It hasn't. This is a trial. This is a test. This is for us to show ourselves approved because we are going to be springboarded into an eternity that's going to last forever that you're going to rule and reign. This is going to be the center of the, oper of the base of operations. Man, it's mind-blowing. I wish more people would understand what's going on. And listen closely because in chapter 22, it reveals some key elements of what the future will be like. God's not trying to tell us everything about the New Jerusalem. He's giving us some key elements. Just like he doesn't try to tell us everything about the stars. We have people who study the stars, astronomers, for their whole lifetimes. They write books on it. They become doctorates on it. God said five things about the stars, the Bible says, and he made the stars also. He's not trying to explain himself, but in reading scripture, you'll see some points of what's happening. You'll put it together. That hopefully is my forte to bring things together like that. Verse 2 says this, in the middle of the street, and on, notice there's only one street, it's a street of gold. There's not streets of gold, and they're not in heaven. It's in New Jerusalem. And on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The uh, it says, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, just listen to this because you need to understand what's going on. So there's a tree of life. Uh, and this tree of life is in the middle of the river. It's obviously hanging over on both sides of the river. It's massive. It's in that river. And the, the fruit, 12 manners of fruit, and the fruit is for the healing of the nations. Now, remember, this is the New Jerusalem. Another, another translation puts it this way. Uh, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree are the healing of the nation. So obviously, we got a couple things going on. We got an understanding that earth is still having some type of time frame because it's talking about months. So we're not bound by time. So this tells you earth is still bound by time. How many are with me? Time is a man thing. It's not a God thing. A day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years, but a day. So it says it's for the leaves or for the chair, for the healing of the nations. Now, just listen to this and don't try to th figure it out. Let me explain it to you. This is the tree of, uh, this is a rendition of the tree of life. And so, uh, let me just explain something that's going on. Last time we heard about the tree of life, and don't miss this because this is really what's going to tie it all together for you tonight. The last time we heard about the tree of life, does anybody know where? The Garden of Eden. Remember I told you Revelation chapter 22 reads like Genesis chapter 2. The last time we heard about the, the Tree of Life was in the Garden of Eden. Listen to what it says. 
It says, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Let me go a little further and tell you about it. And the Lord said, God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, as after the sin, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. So he drove the man out and placed at the east of the garden, east, uh, placed at the east of the garden of Eden, cherubim, flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life, to keep man from the tree of life. Obviously, this tree of life can give immortality. So who will need immortality? You won't. You have a glorified body. You will be living forever. So who will need immortality? Anybody? The people, the people that are left on earth. The people that are going to be the base of operations that we're going to rule over on earth. This is not preached. It's not taught. I don't know if people don't want to wrap their heads around it, but there's going to be humans that are going to last forever uh, as long as they eat of the tree of life. Adam, when would Adam and Eve die if they didn't sin? When would they have died if they didn't sin? Never. Why? Because they ate the tree of life. You're looking at me like I have nine heads. How many of you get it? How many don't get it? They ate the tree of life. Adam and Eve, had they not sinned, when would they have died? Never. They, as long as they ate the tree of life. So what would they have done? Multiplied. They would have multiplied. And then what? And then rolled. They would have filled the earth. And then once they filled the earth, what would they have done? We're, we're pushing 8 billion people right now. We don't live thousands of years. If we lived thousands of years, we'd have 100 billion people on this planet. We'd never be able to support people. How many understand what I'm saying? So where would we go? We'd have to have some technology given to us, some supernatural technology given to us to take us to some other planets so that they can be seated there. So the earth is the base operation. That's why I say we're so close. We are the base of the rest of God's creation. Paul said that we're going to rule in the worlds, S, to come. Worlds. So here's our problem. We have a concept that, oh, Walmart and the Galleria, and that's our concept. Our concept is so limited, it's not even funny. Our house, we live over here, we have this kind of car, we have this... Pay. Our concept is so limited. All we think about is our little circle of what we have. We don't ever think about things like this. But then you've got to ask yourself a question. So why did God make you? Why are you created? To go to Walmart and the Galleria and to buy a car? Obviously, he has a bigger plan in store for us. Somebody say amen. So the tree of life shows back up in the New Jerusalem, which means that people are going to have to get that tree of life. They're going to have to get that manner of fruit. They're going to have to have some access to that, to that New Jerusalem to get the manner of fruit set for the nations so the nations can live forever. Let me tell you the, one of the most important things that's going to happen on planet Earth right after New Jerusalem comes down is somebody being representative of each nation to go to, to, go to the New Jerusalem to be able to get the, tree of life, get the fruit so that they can bring it back and people can live forever. It's a powerful, powerful concept that the scripture tells you it's about. So... Uh, so how did Adam and Eve, mortals, live forever before they say, sinned? They were not immortal, by the way. They were mortals. They ate from the tree of life, which makes you live forever. They were literally forbidden to eat from it after they sinned. Why? Because the wages of sin is what? Death. Death. Physical and spiritual. So they couldn't eat from the tree of life. God wouldn't let them because they would have, they would have uh, been able to eat. They would have been able to live forever. So come on. You should be getting it by now. This is the same tree we see growing on both sides of the river of the New Jerusalem. So... Who is it for? It's not for us. At this time we will be immortal in our glorified bodies already living forever. Just follow it. Revelation 22 tells us who this tree of life is for. God here is recreating his original plan for mankind. Did God make a mistake when he created Adam and Eve and told them to be fruitful, multiply, and live on the planet? No. His, that's his design. That was his plan for humans, for mortals. But when sin came, man was never intended to go to heaven. Adam and Eve were never intended to go to heaven. The Bible says that God walked with them in the cool of the garden in the middle of the day. They were never intended to go to heaven. Where else were they never intended to go? Hell. Hell wasn't created for man. It was created for who? Satan and his, and his angels. So it was never created for man. But when they sinned, they had spiritual and physical separation. Physically, they started to die. Remember that 19-year-old I told you about that looks in the mirror every morning? Now I'm seeing myself getting older and older and older. I'm, I'm dying. I mean, not right now, but I'm dying. Every, every seven years, I hate to throw this on you, every seven years, the cells in your body change. You're actually not your same person. You have not one single cell after seven years of living that you have right now. So your bodies are dying. And every time they, they replicate, you, your DNA uh, unzips. Uh, what that means is, where you didn't have lines on your eyes, 
Now the next cells that are coming in are a little bit weaker and a little bit weaker and a little bit weaker and finally your eyes used to be here, they're down here. You understand what I'm saying? So we're, we're, de we're decaying. It's the, it's the wage of sin. It, it's death. Uh, and spiritual separation. Jesus came to give us spiritual uh, reunion with, with God. And our glorified bodies gives us physical re reunion with God. We do not die anymore. We become immortal. So he, f he uh, does this. Listen to what Revelation says. And there shall be no more curse. Because death is a curse. I, listen, work is a curse. Somebody say Amen. It's part of the curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, the new Jerusalem, and his servant shall serve him. So, we know that, uh, that there's no more curse. Where do we read of a curse before? Well, we read of a curse in Genesis. In Genesis, when sin comes, we have, a, we have a curse. God cursed the serpent, the first thing. Then he cursed the woman, Eve. He actually didn't curse Adam. He cursed the ground for Adam. Adam, 1 Timothy says, was not, uh, was not beguiled by the serpent. The serpent came to Adam before he ever came to Eve. And Adam never sinned. He, Adam, Eve's sin was disobeying God and her husband. Adam's sin was idolatry. He worshipped Eve more than he worshipped the word of God. And so he didn't want her to die alone. But the curse came. The curse came from the serpent, the woman, Adam, and then finally the earth in that order. That's why you see a new heaven and a new earth. God's restoring everything. Also in Revelation chapter 22, verse 3, God sets up his eternal rule over his creation. It's called a theocracy. Uh, theo, God. Crazy, God rule. Look, I'm ready for November 9th. I'm ready for all this stuff to be over. I'm sick and tired of it. Somebody say amen. amen. Nobody agrees with me? Somebody say amen. How many are sick and tired of the election? Uh, I am sick and tired. I'm ready for November 9th. I am just over ready for November 9th. I'm tired of the race for rule. America doesn't need a president. It needs a savior. Amen. World governments. Democracy. Demo. Kraton. The people's rule. Representatives rule for the majority, supposedly. Republic. Republica. The, peop the public thing, uh, sovereignty resides in the people. We are actually a democratic republic. We are not a democracy. We're a republic. Uh, enlightened despotism. Absolute rule by one who seizes power. Like a Caesar. Or like a Hitler. You have monarchy. One person has hereditary right to rule all, all others. That's the queen. Even though the queen is just a figurehead, uh, they, she still has to open Congress or a Parliament uh, at the beginning of every year. It's just tradition. Socialism. The state ownership and dis uh, distribution of wealth. Bernie Sanders should be right under here. <laughs> Communism. Major resources owned by the community rather than individuals. Fascism. National identity more important than individual freedoms. The fatherland. Uh, Deutschland über alles. Uh, Nazism. National socialism. Same as fasc fascism except military authoritarianism advances the cause more rapidly. These are the governments of men. Yes, I believe America has the best government. That doesn't mean America is not flawed. Let me tell you why. Uh, that, and none of these are pure. In communism, you're supposed to have major resources owned by the community rather than individuals, but yet in communism, there's creeping capitalism. There are bonuses that are given. That's not communistic. And in America, a republic, we're supposed to be, we're not supposed to be communistic, yet there's creeping communism. We have, we have unemployment compensation, taken from the haves and given to the have-nots. We have uh, disability, taken from the haves, now that may be social programs, but they're communistic. And so we are flawed. America, uh, the world is flawed in its rule. Let me tell you a little bit more about it. The uh, ultimate thing, theocracy, is theocratia, government by God. An Ayatollah Khomeini has re is leading a theocracy, believe it or not. He is, nobody, even the, even the uh, prim, prime minister, the president of Iran, can't do anything with the, uh, with the spiritual leader there unless the spiritual leader Ayatollah, Iran, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini says something. The Incas, they had an emperor descended from the sun god. The Egyptians, Pharaoh descended from the sun god. That, those are all theocracies. All human types of government, given enough time, will, through evolution of power, turn to a theocracy with the man is God. M governments are corrupt. American government is corrupt. It may be the least corrupt, but let me tell you something. People who are in rule in America think they're gods. I mean, come on, the president gets what, $450,000 a year? That's nothing. So why in the world would you go through all that and run for it? Because of the power. You, you'll be, you'll, POTUS always likes to say he's the most powerful man on earth. If you ever hear any, any movies or any, I'm the most powerful man in the free world. Well, you know what? That's why they run for it, because there's some type of, some type of draw to be able to, to rule everyone. Because it's in our nature. Because we're called 
to be rulers and reigners. And so if we don't do it God's way, we're going to do it our way. Watch. Roman Republic, which started out as a democracy, by the way. Rome and Greece is where we, owe, where we owe our democracy to. We are based on their laws. Monarchy is an emperor. That usually came after that. Then they had a theocracy. Caesar became God. That's why, that's why you had a two brute. American Republic, democracy. Monarchy is freedom. Theocracy, man's constitution is God. So now our God is our constitution, even though we, we fracture it all the time. Uh, future world leader, democracy. It'll be re this, is the, this is the Antichrist. It'll become a monarchy, a, f a dictatorship, fascism, Nazism. One world leader, he will act as God and ultimately will do that. So what is a theocracy? Well, a theocracy is this. Theo, God, crazy, rule, pure purpose. People exist to worship the leader who in turn supplies for their every need. Now watch this one because it's pretty powerful. Leadership, God, who demands complete rule. Freedom of speech, unlimited, will center willingly, there's the word, around the leader. Do you know what, do you know what the fascism does and socialism does and communism does? They shut down the free papers. They shut down free speech because they want they want to be in the best light. Well, you will want to praise God in a theocracy. How many are with me today? How many are with me today? This is powerful stuff. Um, religion is man-made, by the way. Worship will replace it. Religion is man's way to God. Yet religion is pathetic. Because religion says, do this, don't do this, do this. It has nothing to do with God. It has to do with God's relationship. Uh, race, human. No distinctions. Uh, war and peace. There will be no more war. Eternal peace. Ultimate goal, to have total rule with the bride forever so as to continue in God's plan for the ages because that's what the whole thing's about. Man, that right there, we can, see, we can close up shop and say you went to church even though this isn't a church. All right, you ready? You still with me tonight? So we don't need a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. It's not anyway. We need a God who lives in his people, is worshipped by his people, and righteously rules his people. Revelation 22.3 tells us it's coming. It is coming. Look, man's governments just don't work. They never work. Uh, the, the worst sometimes is just the, is that they become, they become godlike. But here's a pure theocracy. We don't need enlightened despots, royal families, ayatollahs, dictators, emperors, parliamentarians, or presidents. We need a king. And that's what we're headed for. Uh, King Jesus, to rule the world and eternity. Soon he will do just that. Look at Revelation chapter 22, verse 4 and 5. And they will see his face, and his name will be written on their foreheads. And there will be no night there, no need for lamps or sun, for the Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign forever and ever. This is us, the new Jerusalem. This is our, his servants. So no wonder why the enemy during tribulation wants to put a number or a name on the foreheads of his servants. He's duplicating something God's going to do for eternity. Your citizenship won't be a card that you carry. You won't be a card-carrying uh, Democrat or a card-carrying communist. You will be a forehead-carrying God. Uh, you will be, so, you will be, you will be uh, marked with, God, with God's new name in your forehead. So let me give you a little recap of the vision. Verse 6. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the Holy Prophet sent this angel to show his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. Uh, as we continue on, uh, verse 7 says this. It says, Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the words of this prophecy of this book. And now that's an interesting statement, blessed. Uh, we hear a lot of people saying, I want to be blessed, or uh, we want to hear a lot of people praying that they're going to be blessed. So what does it mean to be blessed? When little Susie prays at night, when she says, and Lord, bless Mommy, and bless Daddy, and bless Uncle John, what's she really saying? Uh, well, it's not what we think. We have the wrong idea of blessings. A really wrong concept. Jesus told us to his blessed in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 12. He's called the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. Blessed are those, how many remember? So blessings come, according to Jesus, this way. Jesus told us who was blessed in Matthew 5.12, where he lists those who were to be blessed in the Beatitudes on the, on the Sermon on the Mount. According to Jesus, little Susie is saying, let them be poor in spirit, let them be mourning, meek, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, merciful, pure, peacemakers, and persecuted. Wow. According to Jesus, those are the ones who are really blessed. So how could these uh, such things lead to happiness? Well, it seems like it leads more to the opposite of happiness, doesn't it? But the Beatitudes tells us something uh, very specific. We can never be happy when we lead self-centered lives. Self-centered lives will never make you happy. And that, unfortunately, is what America sometimes is all about. The more things we can stuff into our house, the more things we can stuff into our, into our 401ks, that's wonderful, that's fine. But that's not going to give you happiness. That's not going to give you joy. 
Blessed are the things that Jesus said. You get blessed when you, when you do for others. You get blessed when you, when you reach out with the gospel. Here in Revelation, we're promised we will be blessed. How will we be blessed? We will be, when we say ruling the nations, it's not with an iron hand. We're going, to be, we're going to be the substance for people to actually live. We're going to be the things that make people's lives great. Uh, you're going to be a ruler over people, and those people are going to love you because you're going to do everything for them. And so it's a whole different concept. Revelation chapter 22, verse 8 and 9 goes on. And I know I'm going quickly, but that's okay. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel. He's calling this bright one an angel. who showed me these things. Then he said to me, by the way, angels have no sex. So when you hear that word, he, there's something different going on. Then he said to me, see that you do not, that, do, not do that. For I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and those who keep the words of this book, worship God. Now, what in the world's going on here? I've told you this before, so I'm going to tell you again. It's Daniel. Daniel's the one that shows in the New Jerusalem. What happened was, Daniel lived in 600, 600 B.C. God took Daniel out of time, and he took John out of time to our future, put him in the same spot. Daniel sees it uh, probably a couple minutes before John does, and he starts to show him everything that's going on. Now, the revelation's given to Daniel way back in the Old Testament. He saw it way back in 600 B.C. and wrote about it. And he was told by God back then, if you read the book of Daniel, to seal up the words of what he saw. How many of you remember reading that? God said, seal those words up to Daniel. Now watch. Until, he says, until the time of the end. Now, 696 years later, he's, he's revealing those words to John. You want proof of it? Watch this. Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Revelation, Revelation 22.10. So Daniel's opening up the words that God told him to seal 600 years, 694 years before. Man, if you can't see the, the, the connection of Scripture, how many are starting to see this whole thing start to connect? How many are starting to see it all connect? How many are asleep? How many are still with me? How many are seeing it connect? This is, the, this is not just taking a verse out of here. I do not like anybody who is a preacher or a teacher takes one verse and preaches something that doesn't connect anything in the Bible. You've got to connect it. This is the whole thing. This is the whole story. This is, the, this is the, the whole ball of wax. As it goes on, it goes on to say this. Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. Now remember, this is being written, even though we're talking about the New Jerusalem, it's being written to people who have not seen it yet. People are still living in their lives. To us, it's the people still going through temptations. So here's what it says. Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. That's kind of an interesting statement, isn't it? So you want to sin, go ahead and sin. If that's true, you're only hurting yourself. If you want to go and continue to do wrong, then do it. I just showed you where, where people are going to go who worship me and what's going to happen in their lives. But if you want to keep doing what you want to do, then do it. How many times have you said that to your kids? How many times you say, oh, you know what, I can't tell you anymore. You want to do this? Keep doing it. Go ahead. Do whatever you want to do. Thankfully, I've never had to say it to my kids. Let him who do, is vile continue to be vile. Let him who does right continue to do right. Let him who is holy continue to be holy. Behold, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may go through the gates into the city. So he's talking about this, this being this Alpha and the Omega. By the way, when I look at... Uh, Hear the words Alpha and Omega. I'm always taken back to, to Jerusalem. I'll be going there in December again. And this is the Garden Tomb. That Garden Tomb was discovered by, uh, in 1899 by General Gordon. Uh, it, he, he actually felt the Holy Spirit tell him where it was. They dug 22 feet down in the earth and found this, a first century tomb with, an, with, a, with, a, with a one grave in it that was, that was cut out and another grave that wasn't. It was a new tomb. It fits the scriptures perfectly. Those little blocks there have been added because of the, uh, it was broken. Over here is a, rolling, this is a trough for a rolling stone right here. This is called the soul hole. What happens in Israel, or Jews, what they would do is they would put people in a, they'd lay them out just like we would, like awake. And they would give them three days. They believed in three days. It's just tradition. They believed that their soul had to leave. And so it's a weird tradition, but this is the soul hole for their soul to leave. This had a stone around it. This is a first century tomb. Uh, inside that tomb, there are two spots. This one is, is Jesus' spot. They're, they had a, a lentil right over here, a piece of stone. Uh, I have a picture from 1899. I bought it in a little place, a little antique store in Israel. It's probably worth, I don't know, maybe $20,000. It's only one of its kind. It shows the stone there as soon as they opened up two days afterwards. 
And uh, it's the only picture I know of. I told the garden team about it. They want it for their thing. I'm probably not going to give it to them. I'll bring it in and show it to you. But it has this lentil. There was a thin piece of stone right here. This is a new tomb. There's one here and there's one here. This is a place where you can sit. This is a place where you can sit where the angels were. This right here had its feet carved out because what they did in a new tomb was that a limestone. What they did in a new tomb is they didn't cut the feet out until the person whoever died is going to be buried in because they didn't know how tall they were. So if they were taller, they cut the feet out. Only this side is cut out, which means someone was here. There is nothing in that tomb. They've studied it for DNA. They've studied, as soon as they opened it, they studied it for any, any kind of remains. Nothing. They've gone in, archaeologists have gone in over and over. What they did find is right here from the first century. It's a first century graffiti. It's a cross from the first century with the words, with the letters Alpha and Omega. That's a first century. So when I think of Alpha and Omega, I think of this first century graffiti. People were worshiping at this spot. And they knew that this was the spot where Jesus had resurrected from. So he says is the Alpha and the Omega, one of the earliest graffitis that is there. Revelation 22, 15. For without, outside the city, outside the people who don't want to be part of the righteousness, are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loves and makes a lie. Now what do dogs have to do with that? How many have dogs? What does a dog have to do with all those people? Well, we, we are, we are uh, Westerners. We just don't get the picture, do we? Let me tell you why. In Jesus' day, in John's day, what happened was cities had walls on them. And in those walls, where you could put anything that died had to be outside the city. If you died, you had to be buried outside the city. And so if you had garbage, you'd throw it outside of the city in the wall. There was a, there was a dung gate, actual dung gate, where they brought garbage out and they brought all kinds of stuff out. And criminals, if they were killed, they were put in one of the valleys outside the city. That valley, by the way, is, named, is called Gehenna, the valley of, the valley of uh, uh, so it was on fire. It was, uh, we get our word Gehenna hell from that valley that's right outside Jerusalem. So what happens is when you put them out there, all that refuse and those dead bodies, what do you think happens? Wild dogs come, hordes of them, and they eat the garbage. That's why dogs are included here, because dogs represent somebody who is just wild, carnal in nature. How many are getting this? And so it makes your Bible come alive when you see it. Here in Revelation 22, it's re-emphasizing of who will be omitted from entering the city, even though they've already been judged in the great white throne judgment. He's going back and telling you. Revelation 22, 16, I'm going quickly. It says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Boy, I love that one. The bright and morning star. When you get up in the morning and you look at the, uh, you look outside, you'll see the moon. If it's still kind of twilight, or not twilight, but if it's dusk, you'll not dusk. If it's early morning, you'll see the dawn. You'll see the moon. And at, next to the moon, you almost always see a star. That star is Venus. It's called the morning star. The, the Israelites knew all about the stars. Jesus was saying, I am the first and the last. By the way, Venus will stay next to the moon way until, uh, way until uh, light comes. It's always there. And so he's saying that uh, he's the bright and morning star, the root and the offspring of David. Um, this is Jesus, slain from the foundation of the world, the Bible says. There's a, there's a time verse for you. Uh, to fulfill God's ultimate plan for the ages. Uh, wounded for our transgressions, it says. Bruised for our iniquities. Uh, in Revelation 22, 17, it tells us this. It tells us, and the spirit and the bride keep on saying, come, and let anyone hearing say, come, and let anyone thirsting come, let anyone that wishes take, wishes take life's water freely. What it's saying is this. This revelation was written not to tell us, not to tell us just where we're going. As a matter of fact, the, God's not really concerned of us, about us knowing everything where we're going to go. He's concerned about us having an invitation to go. And warning and helping others to get that spot. This is the whole purpose of Revelation to tell us what's going to happen to good and evil, but also to say well, you have an invitation to come. The Spirit and the Bride says, "Come." That's the church. The Bride is always re uh, referred to as the church. It's an invitation. This is where we're at. We're in the gospel age. We're opening up the invitations. It's one of the reasons why I'm preaching it. Uh, so it's still while there's still time, come. One man producing an eternal family. That's what this is about. This is the Alpha and the Omega. You have one man coming from from Adam's fall, from the tree of life. Where the serpent was. One man is produced by a by a, a tribe of people. You have you have Adam, Seth, Noah, Shem, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the way up to Jesus. One one tribe produces one man, and one man produces a family. 
That's us. We're part of the family of God. Listen, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star, spirit of the bride says, come, let him that is a thirst come, whosoever will, take him of the water of life freely. Surely I come quickly, says the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the last message of God's holy word. It's an invitation. It's for us to come. So people on YouTube tonight, uh, let me tell you, there's people that watch this thing that are not saved. There's people that watch this that are interested in the end times. But the whole idea of me touching, teaching Revelation is to give you an invitation, if you don't know him to come to Christ because you can have all the knowledge on the planet you can know everything you want to know and if you don't have that invitation and you don't seal him in your heart you're not going it's as simple as it is and so uh, I'm preaching to the choir here but that's not necessarily true on YouTube we get emails every now and then telling us that so it's a full circle we know that it's all the way down the line and as I continue on just look, listen just real quick as I get ready to close Isaiah 44 6 thus saith the Lord the King of the Israel and his Redeemer the Lord of hosts this is back in Isaiah I am the first and I am the last and beside me there is no God. I am. It's the great Jehovahistic title, by the way. To Moses, he said, I am. Who I say sent me? To, Phar to the Pharisees, he says, I am. First in Isaiah is the word Rishon in the Hebrew. It means before time. Jesus existed before time. Uh, last in Isaiah is Acharon. It means uh, uttermost, the very last after time. So here's the deal. We are living in the gap between eternity past and eternity future. You and I are right here from creation, Genesis 1-1 to uh, 2 Peter, the new heaven and new earth. We are, way, we are right here. There's been ages. We have had the age of innocence, the age of sin, the age of the law, the age of the cross, the age of grace, which we're living in now, the age of tribulation, and then the age of wrath, and the age of innocence again. It's a full circle. We are headed towards eternity future. You are here by divine plan. You're saved by divine plan. You didn't choose God. He chose you. So you got to ask yourself a question. Why did he choose you? Well, he chose you because he has a design for you for eternity. How many are with me tonight? God does not want this book altered in any way, by the way. This is what he says. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to the plagues which are written in this book. If anyone takes away the words of this book of the prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. It goes on and says this. He that testifies these things says, Surely I come quickly, e amen, even so, Lord, come. That word for come quickly in the Hebrews, in, in the Greek, is this, Maranatha. You may have heard it. it means, it's Aramaic, actually. And it means, come, Lord Jesus. It's actually a prayer. It's a plea. It's a petition. So as I close tonight, the message of Revelation 22 is that Jesus Christ is able to forgive, he's able to heal, he's able to restore. The one who heals is the one who also reigns, and therefore the healing of his lamb has full authority. It will last forever. Jesus, the Lamb, is able to keep his sheep and sustain them for all time. John chapter 10 tells us that. John's vision in Revelation 22 is one of ultimate authority. It's a vision of hope, rescue, and pureness of intent. It has a very practical implications. The reason a Christian does not despair in the midst of sinfulness and confusion of our own generation is because there's a tree that heals, a tree that stood on Golgotha. See, the tree of life for us is Calvary. It's, it's, a tree that, it's the tree of Christ. That's the life for us. Because of that living hope, there's no person or situation that's hopeless. I've been a pastor for a long time. That's my message to anybody that comes in and says, oh, you don't understand. I tell them, listen, there is no such thing as a hopeless situation. Anything we face today in life, whether it be alcoholism, racial, racial hatred, pre uh, prejudice, heathenistic selfishness, or even self-righteousness, must fall at the presence of God. The book ends as it began with the first love that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. The book ends with the assurance and the faithfulness of that. Surely I come quickly. That's how it starts. That's how it ends. We live by grace. And it's by grace that we're saved and by grace that our, our sins are forgiven. And it'll be by grace that we obtain the new Jerusalem. Here is the rock upon which our build we build our lives. The faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ will last. His grace will last forever. As I close today, let me just tell you, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. That's the last. You know what? I need grace. You know why? Because God is not for perfect people. He's for imperfect people. He's for people like me that sometimes mess up. I said that once from the pulpit and I had a group of ladies get together and want to have a prayer meeting for how I messed up. <laughs> Go figure. Here it is. Your worst days are never so bad that you are beyond the reach of God's grace. Your best days are never so good that you're beyond the need of God's grace. Grace isn't a little prayer you say before receiving a meal. It's a way to live. New heaven and new earth. A renewed universe. That's what God is promising us. So let's bow our heads tonight as we pray. Father, again, we thank you. I thank you, Lord, for this study. I thank you for those who have come, Lord God. I thank you, Lord, that there is a desire and need for all of us, Lord, because we are imperfect. We need you. And Lord, we're thankful that we can get the knowledge. But Lord, more than the knowledge, we're thankful for the grace that just applies like an icing over our life and covers our sins. 
And Lord, I'm just thankful for Christ, for the tree of life that we can take from every day. I pray a blessing on everyone that's here tonight, Lord God, every family. In Jesus' name, amen. Revelation, that's it. Thank you. Any questions before we, close, before we leave tonight? Anybody have any questions? Listen, if you do have any questions, write them down, no matter what they are. Next week, please come. We're going to have some question and answers. Well, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, make sure we're, we're verbal with all the questions so people at YouTube can find out and hear it so we can uh, repeat them. And we'll answer those questions. It can be on anything in the Bible you want. Uh, it's time to stump me. So you just want to come and uh, let's just talk about it, okay? God bless. Thank you for coming tonight.